meeting is being recorded. Welcome everyone. We're gonna give a few seconds for everyone to join from the waiting room. Welcome everyone. We're going to give it just another minute for everyone to join and then I will kick us off. Good to be with you. Okay, it looks like we have a good critical mass right now and it's seven o'clock. So I'm going to go ahead and kick us off. My name is Kim Kuda Dring and I'm the Director of Learning and Engagement here at the Cummer Museum of Art and Gardens. On behalf of our Director and CEO, Dr. Andrea Barnwell Brownlee, and our entire Board of Trustees, I am very delighted to welcome you to this virtual lecture tonight. Our talk this evening is the final in a three-part series that has been graciously hosted by Cummer Beaches, which is an affinity group of the Cummer Museum of Art and Gardens, and generously sponsored by Dr. Diane Jacobson. Now, works from the Jacobson collection are currently on view at the museum. You may have heard about this. We just opened last week. The exhibition is called American Made, Paintings and Sculpture from the DeMille Jacobson Collection. And before we get started, I would love to thank our sponsors of this exhibition, which includes the City of Jacksonville, the Cultural Council of Greater Jacksonville, Ronald and Karen Retner, State of Florida, the Robert D. Davis Family Endowment, the Schultz Family Endowment, the Van Vleck Family, the Director Circle Donors at the Cummer Museum, and J.P. Morgan Private Bank. Thank you all for making this possible. The title of today's talk is The Power of Sculpture, Masterpieces of Sculpture from Middle Ages to Modern Day in the Cummer Museum and the DeMille Jacobson Collections. So before I introduce our speaker for this evening, just a little virtual housekeeping. A recording of this talk will be available on the Cummer Museum YouTube, YouTube channel in the coming weeks. If you're looking for the prior two virtual talks, those are already available. So I encourage you to check those out. We would love to hear from you this evening. So while you all will not be visible or audible during this program, we will have time for Q&A after about 45 minutes. Feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A, which is below. Um, and Scott and the rest of us will answer as many as we can. You also might see us prompt you in the chat just to remind you to ask questions um, along the way. With that, let me introduce you to our speaker this evening. Dr. Scott Brown, Professor of Art History at the University of North Florida, also called UNF. Uh, Scott's been with us for all three lectures. He told me earlier he is hitching a ride to Italy tomorrow to go see some amazing churches. So we're very excited and honored to have you with us this evening. Scott, go ahead and take it away. Thank you so much, Kim. Uh, and thank you to the Cummer and to Dr. Uh, uh, Brownlee, to uh, Diane Jacobson, to Cummer Beaches, to all of you for being here this evening. Uh, and a special thanks to uh, Diane Jacobson, who sponsored these Cummer Beaches lectures for a number of years now. Uh, it's a rare and special pleasure then to talk about Diane's collection as the topic of our lecture today with the opening last week of her exhibition, American Made, uh, which has been touring the country and has come to us here in Jacksonville for the summer. It's a marvelous exhibition, and if you haven't seen it yet, it really is fabulous, fantastic. I, 
as I as Kim just suggested, I'm going to Italy tomorrow, so I chose uh, Thomas Moran's Landscape of Venice as my backdrop. You can see that painting down in the in the exhibition if you go down to the camera to take a look. Uh, the our topic today is actually uh, the red haired beauty, private art, public art, and access to beauty in American society. And this is a story about a collection, uh, about Diane's collection and about the conversations that happen between the works in a collection, really conversations between artists, as we'll see. I uh, was introduced to Diane a number of years ago now, many uh, five, six years ago, I suppose. And the work that is the, the launching point for our talk today is the very first work from her collection that I spent a, a, a period of time looking at, that I looked closely at. And close looking is, is the fundamental uh, method of art history for me, spending time with a single work, getting to know it, getting to ask uh, critical questions about it to see what it tells us about the history of art. And this is a work that I found powerfully revealing. I actually met Diane and I'll tell a little story about, uh, about her. Uh, in a class I was teaching on Dutch Baroque painting, I uh, gave a lecture in this class on paintings within paintings. The Dutch were famous for this, as in this example by Gabriel Metsu, where we see uh, a painting of a seascape, a stormy sea and a ship potentially in trouble in a stormy sea on the wall behind the uh, two women. There's a letter in the hand of the uh, uh, the woman, the maid here, a letter which it, uh, the picture implies has been sent from a husband who's away at sea on business. And the stormy sea is a sign of, of uh, trouble in the offing, of bad news in the letter, potentially. Uh, in other words, works of art within works of art are often used in order to convey meanings, to tell stories, to create allegories, and to add dimensions of significance. So after this talk uh, in this particular class, Diane came up to me afterwards and said, uh, Scott, I have a painting in my collection that has images within it. I wonder if, if you would have anything to say about them. And she sent me uh, duly a, uh, uh, a photograph of her painting, The Red-Haired Beauty, by the American artist Edwin Howland Blashfield. I was immediately struck by it, I will say taken by it, because it is a terrific example of a sort of art historical painting. And Diane was absolutely right. The images within the image are very revealing and very communicative. Uh, and so as an art historian, it was too provocative to me not to follow up and to figure out what uh, the artist was trying to say by including these quotations or these references to other images. The red-haired beauty, as we see her here, sitting in the middle of the picture, is actually seated on one of the most famous artworks uh, of antiquity. She's seated atop a portion of the Parthenon Panathenaic procession relief. You can see here this charioteer which is represented in the bas relief, which the, the red-haired beauty is treating as a kind of seat or a stool. It is actually a piece of the Panathenaic procession frieze. Uh, as we see here on the right, uh, the arc of the horse's tails and the posture of the charioteer are almost identical. Uh, Edwin Helen Blashfield has not, let's say, copied the image photographically, but he's translated it into the image. But this is not the only art historical reference within the red-haired beauty. The beauty is seated on the Parthenon sculptures, but she's staring at this table, this little copper table, bronze table, which is laden with these small figurines, these little statuettes. This was my introduction to uh, what are called Tanagra figurines. Tanagra was a city in ancient Greece that was famous for producing these small terracotta figurines uh, of great delicacy and great beauty. 
very, very different from the giant monumental marble reliefs that decorate the Parthenon. These are small intimate objects often produced as household or grave goods. It's the kind of art that people lived with, whereas the Panathenaic procession reliefs is the kind of art that people worshiped at. So very different categories of art here. One private, personal, intimate, uh, decorative, and the other monumental, marble, uh, classical art in all of its grand severity. This marvelous image then of the red-haired beauty seated atop the Parthenon sculptures and staring at these little decorative figurines from ancient Greece was a picture that seized my imagination. All the more so because of the title of the work, which refers here to the vibrantly red, brilliant, flame-like hair of the beauty. In fact, as I understood uh, fairly quickly after uh, making these other connections to classical art, this itself is a classical reference. Uh, many of us perhaps don't realize today that ancient Greek statues and sculptures, even the Parthenon reliefs, were all probably painted at one point in time. And the hair, as we can see in the example on the left of this famous statue, the Peplos Kore, the hair of uh, female figures in ancient Greek sculpture were, uh, was typically painted red, this dark, vibrant, ochre red color. The red-haired beauty then I interpreted as yet another art historical reference to the idea of the use of paint in ancient Greek statuary. Now, uh, as I began to look more deeply into this picture, I began to realize that these art historical references were a part of an allegory. And what we have here is in the form of the Parthenon sculpture, an ancient Greek marble sculpture of the greatest fame from the greatest, most famous monument of classical antiquity, the Parthenon of Athens. Uh, many of us have probably seen these sculptures either in Athens or perhaps in the British Museum. The remnants of the Parthenon are the most famous statuary elements and sculpture elements of ancient Greece. We know them today in all of their white, marble, pristine purity, but in fact, archaeologically, we can say now all of these sculptures would likely have been painted in antiquity. So we have the red-haired beauty, this vibrant, colorful figure. Her name itself suggests a kind of color moniker, which, which implies the importance of color, in this case, of paint, because we're looking at a painting. This is, in Blashfield's telling, a representation of color restored to the marble sculptures of the Parthenon, the red-haired beauty paint painting is seated atop the ancient marble relief, the Parthenon. There is here then a modern uh, retrospection, a modern thinking about the role of color in monumental art, which is brought home all the more powerfully by these little Tanagra figurines, which, which are quite colorful themselves. As you can see here, Blashfield actually based his figures, the figurines, on actual museum pieces today. The Tanagra figurines were a uh, huge phenomenon in the late 19th century. They were, they were excavated beginning in the 1870s. A huge trove of them was discovered in the ancient tombs of the city of Tanagra. And uh, the sculptures, the figurines, which were found in the tombs, emerged in pristine condition in some cases. Perhaps the most famous figure is this figure in the center here the so-called Dame en Bleu, the Lady in Blue, they were famous in particular because these sculptures came out of the tombs with their painting and their polychromy intact. Now, these were small terracotta figurines, not giant marble sculptures, but they were the first real archaeological evidence that people of Edwin Blashfield's time had for the role of color in ancient Greek art an art that we often think of as colorless, or if anything, stone colored, <laughs> marble colored. But here, rich, vibrant blue, and gold, red, pink, ochre hues came uh, uh, to life on these figurines as they were excavated. And we can see here that the little figurines on the table are themselves not colorless. 
They are pale in tints of rose and lavender, uh, but they are nonetheless uh, colorful. The Dame en Bleu and this figure with the dove at her shoulder are copied directly from famous examples of the Tanagra figurines. Blashfield then seems to be thinking very much in this image about the role of color in art, in monumental art, and in other aspects of decorative art. It's a painting, a small painting, with a very big idea, because Blashfield would, as I knew when I first began looking at this picture, he would go on to become perhaps America's most famous monumental muralist. In other words, he would go on after this painting was made, some six, seven, eight years later, he would go on to become the most important muralist in American art, painting such monuments as the Dome of the Library of Congress and, and, and many, many others, state houses and Capitol buildings and churches and the Cathedral of Washington, many, many, many other monuments. In, in other words, he became an artist who painted on the surfaces of the monumental building, on the surfaces of the, the Parthenon, the modern Parthenon buildings which we were constructing in great numbers in that late 19th, early 20th century. In fact, that period, the late 19th, early 20th century, sometimes known as the American Renaissance, is the era in which we constructed all of the great classical marble columned buildings which adorn our downtowns, our state capitals, our, our, uh, our capital in Washington. So this was a picture then that suddenly seemed to me to be quite important in the terms of the story that it tells about the history of art, a small picture with a big idea. I got very interested in where that big idea came from. Who was this guy, Edwin Blashfield? Well, he was an American from Boston and he went overseas to study in Paris uh, in the 1870s. In the early 1870s, he painted very silly pictures, pictures without any big ideas in them at all. <laughs> Here's a characteristic example. It's a, uh, uh, a picture set in a sort of ancien regime period of France before the revolution, two ladies in the streets smelling nosegays. Or for, in for instance, this other picture in 1876, Tea Time. These are just genre pictures. And, and to be frank, uh, although these are painted when he was still a student and a young person, there's no question. They're not pictures that point toward any grand idea or great ambition to become the great muralist of American painting. There's very little sign in these early works of who Edwin Blashfield would become. In fact, I think it's not until he met his wife in 1876, his future wife, that he began to get his big ideas. All of a sudden, around 1876, 77, after he meets the woman uh, uh, Evangeline Wilbur, who would become his wife, all of a sudden he starts painting much more ambitious pictures, big pictures, pictures with deep historical themes and archeological and art historical perspectives. Suddenly a big idea is entering into Edwin's work. Uh, he starts painting, for instance, some of the most striking pictures. He paints a whole series of ancient female gladiators who are here depicted uh, 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 practicing uh, their battle skills with each other. A very transgressive subject for the 1870s, the idea of, of female gladiators in ancient Rome, which was, in fact, historically, archaeologically accurate, uh, was nonetheless socially inappropriate in this period. These strong, tough women who defied all of the conventions of Victorian society for how women ought to behave in public. I love the title of this work. Uh, Behold with what resounding noise she beareth the well-taught blows. <laughs> this is a work with a big idea. And it is an idea I think we can attribute to Evangeline Wilbur Blashfield. When I first met her at a dance in Paris, Edwin wrote, I suppose that she was some 28 years old. She had the air shared by her sister of thinking that we dancing young men were less than nothing. Later I learned that her 17th birthday was not far behind her. Yet given the quantity and quality of her learning, 28 years would have been all too few to seem reasonable. Evangeline was a remarkable person, a scholar, a thinker, 
uh, a, uh, a brilliant person, and also his model. Edwin used Evangeline throughout his career. The red-haired beauty is, in fact, Evangeline Blashfield, as we can see from this portrait comparison. She was the daughter of a, a famous uh, suffragist, Charlotte B. Wilbur, and a very, very uh, prolific and famous uh, intellectual, Charles Edwin Wilbur, who was, among other things, Victor Hugo's American English translator, translating Les Miserables. He was also America's foremost Egyptologist and the leading international expert on hieroglyphics. He was one of the top archaeologists of the late 19th century. And uh, in fact, that is, I think, where through Evangeline and through Charles Edwin Wilbur, Edwin Blashfield starts to get interested in this art historical and archaeological style of painting. It was in Paris that they met. Evangeline was living there. Edwin was living there as a student. And many, many other American artists of his generation who studied en masse in Paris with the leading masters of the 1870s. In fact, we're introduced to Edwin and Evangeline in a, uh, a little uh, 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 article that was published in 1877, which reports on an exhibition at the studios of uh, Frederick Bridgman and Edwin Blashfield, two young Americans studying both of them in Paris with Jean-Léon Jerome, a French master. And they organized a little soiree at their studios which got in the news. And uh, the, uh, the critic who wrote the report noticed that there was a woman, a lady who had buttonholed Mr. Blashfield with her left hand while with her right, she indicated a picture by Charles Sprague Pierce, another American artist. And in this right hand was a notebook and a pencil. From time to time, she took the pencil and wrote, releasing Mr. Blashfield's buttons, meanwhile to immediately seize them when her writing was done. A nice little snapshot of uh, their relationship in its infancy. Blashfield and Evangeline, Edwin and Evangeline, were in Paris during a period of tremendous importance for American art, when a whole cast of American artists, Frederick Arthur Bridgman, for instance, being one of them, uh, who was Edwin's partner there at the soiree in Paris. We see a piece here from the Demel Jacobson collection by Frederick Arthur Bridgman in the Cove. And as we look around the Jacobson collection, uh, the Demel Jacobson collection, we will see that there are many, many other artists, American artists who were studying in Paris at the same moment in time. This is one of the really remarkable and beautiful ways that a collection like Diane's becomes a conversation among artists. The pieces themselves are in conversation with each other. Frederick Arthur Bridgman, also Elizabeth Jane Gardner Bouguereau, another American who uh, studied in uh, Paris at the same time. Uh, Elizabeth Jane Gardner is a remarkable figure, the first woman to study in the, uh, in the atelier uh, in Paris uh, in the 1870s. She had to dress up in men's clothes to do so. It was a time when uh, uh, women were just beginning to gain access to traditional art education in the ways that men had long had access. And there are a whole series of American women artists, leading figures of the period, who were in Paris at the same time as young Evangeline and Edwin, studying with a series of the great masters, especially with the artists Léon Bonnat and Jean-Léon Jerome and Carolus Duran. There's also Sarah Paxton Ball Dodson, this absolutely exquisite painting, The Honey of the Hymetus, which is in our show at the cover right now. Uh, she was also among this group of women, as was Mary Cassatt, uh, another uh, uh, marvelous uh, American artist who was uh, a part of this crew of expat Americans who were the first generation of American artists to to really go overseas and to study with the old world masters, with the leading masters of the day. And there they imbibed many of the old ideas, but many of the new ideas that were emerging in European modernism, especially the influence of Impressionism. Theodore Robinson is another of the American artists uh, in the collection there at the same time. Uh, this wonderful piece, Washing Day, is in our exhibition. Julius LeBlanc Stewart, William McGregor Paxton. Uh, oops, this should, should read Edward Lord Weeks, excuse me. The title is wrong here. 
Walter Gay, James Carroll Beckwith. All of these artists were together, working together in the same studios with marvelous crossover. And if you go read the art notices from the day back in the 1870s and 80s, you can hear about their interactions with each other after hours, their, their games, their hijinks, uh, the exhibitions they went to. It was an incredibly important period for a generation of extremely ambitious young American artists. John Singer Sargent, likewise, one of the leading figures uh, of this period. These artists were all close, intimate friends, rivals uh, as well, they pushed each other, uh, but partners in a project of American art, which would transform not only the way that Americans made art, but importantly, the way that Americans related to art. The artists of the, uh, this generation, the 1870s and 80s, who studied in Paris, most of them returned to America, which was not true of earlier generations. Uh, earlier American artists who had studied abroad often stayed abroad, but almost all of these Americans came home. And when they came home, they set about transforming the art scene, transforming not just the art scene, but the nation's attitude toward art. There were, in the 1870s, almost no museums in the country. There were no public buildings, no great monuments. Uh, it was all to be built in the next 30 and 40 years. This, this generation of artists who came of age in the 1880s were the ones who saw the production of the great city centers, the monumental architectural structures, and the foundations of the museums that have shaped the world that we have inherited today. When they returned to Paris, uh, many of them, including the young Blashfields, uh, they landed in New York. And many of those who landed in New York lived at the Sherwood Studios. We're looking at here a photograph of a group of artists, including several in the Jacobson collection, Robert Reed and, and uh, William Metcalf. Uh, in one of their uh, studio get-ups, their studio shindigs, all young, ambitious, eager, uh, talented young artists who lived together in a, an art commune. <laughs> the Sherwood Building, which was a, a built in Midtown, New York, was built to be an artist's studio space, a live work space for young artists. And the Blashfields moved there in 1881, the year that the, uh, the Sherwood opened, uh, uh, along with a number of other artists. There were some artists of an earlier generation, uh, Jasper Cropsey, uh, who is a, uh, uh, known as a Hudson Valley School painter. These artists of a, uh, an older age, uh, uh, who uh, some of them mentored and some of them were, were, were uh, sponsors of the young generation. But the young generation of artists that came with Edwin and uh, Evangeline were themselves often uh, ambitious in a way that, that young radicals often are. They wanted to recreate American art. Uh, the beautiful Hudson Valley School paintings are very different in their style, their clear, crisp realism, their monumental scale. Uh, from the kind of pictures that Edwin and his group began making when they arrived back in New York. James Carroll Beckwith lived in the Sherwood Studios. In fact, his uncle owned the place. And so he was sort of a, a famous figure there, a, a central uh, social figure in the group. And uh, this is his painting of his wife, Bertha. Uh, uh, his is, is a style which we can see radically different from the uh, Hudson Valley School style. Uh, an impressionist, loose, painterly style that is uh, in a picture here, which is uh, highly intimate in its proportions, which uh, is a totally different kind of work in terms of its attitude, its aesthetic presence than the monumental image of Niagara Falls, for instance. William Merritt Chase uh, did not live at the Sherwood Studios, but uh, gave James Carroll Beckwith, his dog, Coco, <laughs> which he was very fond of. And James Carroll Beckwith kept it until it was discovered it was against the lease policy to have a dog in the Sherwood Studios. And so he, he had to get rid of it, uh, which is a sort of a sad story. He was very broken up about it. Uh, it even though the place belonged to his uncle, he couldn't uh, get a pass for the dog. But that kind of relationship here between these artists, the, these friends and rivals, 
uh, is characteristic of life in the 1880s for these young artists who are just establishing themselves in their careers. William Merritt Chase would go on to be one of the great uh, picture painters of the late 19th, early 20th century. His picture uh, in the Italian villa is in our show. Robert Reed lived in the Sherwood Studios, one of the leading impressionists of the period, marvelous uh, painter. Willard Leroy Metcalf, Robert Bruce Crane, Augustus St. Gaudens also lived in the Sherwood Studios. Augustus St. Gaudens was a or uh, was a, uh, a monumental sculptor, and he would go on to become one of the great um, uh, decorative sculptors for the period of architecture that was beginning in the late 1880s, early 1890s. Uh, Charles Courtney Curran also lived in the, uh, the Sherwood building. And his uh, picture, Heirlooms, is a marvelous example of the kind of decorative art that these young artists aspired to make. Now, it might sound uh, a little insulting to call an artist's work decorative. I know I've met some artists who would be offended by that. But these men of the 1880s and 1890s, men and women, they embraced the idea of decorative art because for them, that was perhaps the highest ideal of the era. Decorative to them meant not that it was just wallpaper, but meant that it was an aesthetic object that you lived with, that it was central to your idea of your aesthetic space. These are artists who aspired to make work that people wanted that people would want to live with and that people would want to design their lives around. Uh, and uh, the images that we've just seen, which are intimate and colorful and stylistically progressive, they're exactly the kinds of works that they were aspiring to make, works that would be appealing as objects for people to live with. Art was in a moment of trans transition and transformation here in this late 19th century era. And Edwin uh, and Evangeline Blashfield were at the center of this transformation. They were uh, a real power couple in the art community of America, American life in the late 19th century. And one of the areas in which they were really transformative was in their thinking about historical precedents for uh, decoration. Edwin was really deeply influenced by the idea of the Tanagra. Here's another image uh, with Evangeline as the model. We've lost the painting, at, at least I haven't been able to find it. But this is an engraving of a painting, which is based quite, quite clearly on the model of the Tanagra figurine. Uh, here's an example of a work from 1883 that he made shortly after returning to Europe. And you can see, again, the presence of the Tanagra figurines, this dancer figure here, and uh, the cloaked uh, dame en bleu appears over here. Uh, notice the red-haired beauty with her hair flowing behind her as well. This long, frieze-like frame is a very unusual scale and dimension for a painting. It's the kind of frieze-like strip that one would find in an architectural building in ancient Greece, a, a kind of architrave or frieze. And it's, again, a model, an example of the kind of decorative ideal that Edwin is exploring. He envisioned, perhaps uh, at, as a high ideal of this period, that people would design their houses around works of art, rather than just finding something to hang on a wall when the building was done. He envisioned a whole generation of people creating their architectural space around an ideal of decorative Form. And that's the idea that they're really after here, these artists of the decorative age of the late 19th century. The red-haired beauty is one of the most characteristic of his Tanagra figurines, and the Tanagra ideal emerges in these early works as a perfect example of the, the fusion of form and color, of sculpture and painting. Uh, in other words, of monumental and architectural form and colorful painting. Tanagras were, as I said, renowned for their, their painting. Uh, they began to be discovered in the 1870s and excavated and, and then collected widely. They were the subject of a collecting um, uh, uh, fever, really, in the 1880s. Mary F. Curtis is the first scholar to have written about the Tanagra figurines in this book published in 1879. She's actually the cousin of John Singer Sargent. 
uh, Edwin Blashfield in 19, 1893 produced the illustrations for an image of, uh, uh, for a, a book, a monumental or a, um, a poetic epic called Tanagra, which was about the origin of the Tanagra figurines, a kind of mythic retelling of the origin story of these sculptures. But in this origin story, Tanagra itself emerges as a kind of model for America. Athens, of course, is the most famous place in ancient Greece. Very few of us today have heard of Tanagra. Tanagra was a rural and uh, uh, remote city in ancient Greek culture. It was, in some sense, uh, a backwater, much like, in many ways, America in the 19th century in its relationship to the old world, to Europe, to a place with this long history and cultural tradition. America and Tanagra, though, were both places that people thought of something new happening, something distinctive and original and different from the styles of the ancient uh, uh, Greek Athens uh, culture. So, in fact, uh, Edwin and uh, Evangeline and the artists of the Sherwood Studios, the young artists who had studied in Paris, were, as they felt, engaged in the creation or the exploration of new ideas to make American art a kind of new art of Tanagra, a, a new art uh, uh, for the modern age, recalling an ancient ideal that had been forgotten. The uh, image here uh, it is uh, uh, very prescient. It was painted in 1886, but it represents, uh, Edwin depicts the plans for the Dome of St. Peter's and the Pope is pouring over the dome. And the dome, if, if you've ever seen the Dome of St. Peter's is this incredible sculptural painted space full of color and light and architectural form. But when we look at the plans, it's just a blank, flat, white slate waiting to be created. It's only in a phase of imagination. In a few short years, Edwin himself would be painting uh, the dome of the Library of Congress. And this is a painting that looks forward to that future. In 1880, 1886, uh, Edwin uh, uh, was in uh, England with a number of other artists, including John Singer Sargent. And the same year in which uh, uh, John Singer Sargent painted this picture, uh, uh, the Edwin and a group of artists who would go on to become the leading muralist painters of America in the late 19th century were together talking about the future, talking about their dreams and ambitions. This is a painting which is also emblematic of the decorative direction of this uh, new art. Uh, John Singer Sargent, who's so famous for his portraits, here turns the faces of the figures away from us so that the picture becomes about light and color and decorative presence, flowers and lanterns. John Singer Sargent's uh, painting, Elsie Wagg, a portrait in the uh, uh, Demel Jacobson collection is uh, emblematic though of his portrait painting, but also of the kinds of figures that the Blashfields and John Singer Sargent and the other artists of this period were in touch with. Elsie Wagg is a perfect example for us. She was an English woman and a gardener, and uh, her passion in life was creating public gardens. She was very deeply invested in the idea that beauty and natural beauty should not be private, that gardens should be made public, that the public should be given access, and that that access to natural beauty and to gardens would be a feature of a new democratic life in the coming 20th century. Uh, she was very successful and remembered today as one of the most influential uh, garden pioneers of the 19th century. We might uh, think of her in relation to uh, Nina Kummer and the Kummer Gardens and uh, of Nina's role in promoting natural beauty. But she's a figure who is making an argument very similar to the one that Edwin Blashfield and his contemporaries were making, was that art should not be just a private good that it should be something that we live with, both in private and in public. Uh, many other artists of the late 19th century embraced these ideas of uh, the Tanagra, uh, of this ancient idea of uh, an intimate, familiar kind of beauty. The Tanagra figurines, as I said, were famous in the modern age, especially because they were not huge. They didn't belong in temples. They belonged in people's homes. They were humble in one sense. They're all terracotta. They're simply made. That means they're affordable. 
they are not beyond the means of ordinary people. We find artists like Sally James Farnham, Bessie Potter Vanna, uh, producing sculptures which are not huge. They don't belong in uh, gardens and massive outdoor spaces. They're designed to be lived with in people's homes. They are in some sense modern Tanagra sculptures, which are bringing an aesthetic ideal into the home to be lived with. Thomas Pollock Anschutz here, uh, an important artist of the uh, 19th, 20th century, who uh, likewise um, um, figure uh, connected to Edwin Blashfield, produced his painting, The Tanagra. Uh, Child Hassam, uh, who is uh, in our exhibition, uh, likewise produced in 1919 his painting, Tanagra. Uh, you can see the ideas here that emerge here. Uh, we have a statuette an ancient statuette of a woman. Uh, uh, it is faded, it's old. And we have next to it, the vibrant picture of a modern woman, this colorful, beautiful impressionist painting by Child Hassam embodies all the ideas of impressionism in the uh, late 19th, early 20th century. Uh, and, but it makes reference back to this ancient ideal of the Tanagra. Uh, it is an ideal that reminds us that art is something that is meant to be loved and lived with in our homes, in our museums, in our public spaces, the very kinds of spaces that were just beginning to take shape in the late 19th and early 20th century. The rise of public art and public beauty in America is one of the key stories that we can tell through a collection like the Jacobson Collection. Uh, the oldest museums in our country are not that old. The Metropolitan Museum of Art was founded in 1870. Many of the famous museums of the day uh, today were themselves not established until the 1880s, 1890s, early 1900s. We can point to uh, the Detroit Institute of Arts, the St. Louis Art Museum, uh, and many, many, many others. Great, marvelous, fabulous collections that are what we think of as public museums, quintessential public museums, but they were not dreamt of until the 1890s in many cases. One of the key events in American life that changed the calculus or reoriented society toward a new concept of the value of beauty and art was the 1893 uh, World's Fair in Chicago. A huge public art exhibition and architectural exhibition that uh, uh, was a, a, a massive event in American cultural life. Uh, Edwin Blashfield, who in 1885 had produced his, uh, his red-haired beauty uh, and uh, which envisioned a new monumental painting, uh, uh, an architectural kind of painting, a mural painting, was invited in 1893 to paint the uh, dome of the um, uh, one of the pavilion halls at the Chicago exhibition. And the same year, 1893, his wife, Evangeline Wilbur, founded the very first municipal art association. This is like our cultural council in Jacksonville. Uh, we might think that there's always been something like the cultural council in American life, but this is not true. The very first organization for um, civic organization for the promotion of art and culture was the Municipal Art Society, founded in 1893 by Evangeline Wilbur Blashfield, the same year in which her husband began his career in earnest as the foremost mural painter of American art. This is from a speech that she wrote to mark the foundation of the Municipal Art Society. Literally every single cultural council, municipal art organization, civic art organization that, that exists in American life today began because of that movement in 1893. From 1895, we find a, a lecture given by Evangeline about how to make New York a beautiful city. And she's tackling the question fundamentally of what role architecture and art have in a well made city in a city that supports uh, a, a well-lived life, of a, a city that supports equality of aesthetic access among its populations. We have to remember 1893 here is kind of the height of the tail end of the Gilded Age, an age of tremendous 
economic and aesthetic inequality in American life. And there is a, uh, a generation of ambitious young artists who are eager to change and to shape the American conversation about the role and the importance of art, of beauty, and of public investment in beautiful cities in American culture. They're tremendously successful in changing that conversation. From the vision in 1886 of the potential in Edwin Blashfield's painting, Grand Plans, the, the plans for the Dome of St. Peter's. From that vision of potential, within a few short years, the artists of Blashfield's generation have realized that potential. In 1895, Edwin Blashfield is painting the Dome of the, uh, the, uh, the Library of Congress along with many other artists of his generation, close friends and associates, Frederick McMoneys and many others. Here the color murals in the dome of the Library of Congress are by Edwin. Uh, here uh, the Cathedral of St. Matthew the Apostle in Washington, Edwin painted, was the lead painter for the murals. In the Detroit Public Library uh, here, Edwin Blashfield was, led the mural campaign uh, for painting in the 19 teens, uh, a building which was designed by Cass Gilbert, one of the leading uh, American architects of the day. Augustus St. Gaudens, who had lived in the Sherwood studios and studied in France along with Edwin, was uh, the, one of the leading sculptors, and they partnered together on many uh, projects. Augustus St. Gaudens, who's remembered for many sculptures, uh, among others in our last talk in this series, I referenced his William Tecumseh Sherman statue in Central Park, New York. Frederick McMoneys, who I've just referred to, uh, here is his self-portrait from the Jacobson collection. And his uh, Nathan Hale, another work from the Jacobson collection. Nathan Hale, the great American patriot who who declared uh, as his, uh, his uh, execution loomed that he regretted he had but one life to lose for his country. Uh, these are the kinds of narratives, the themes uh, and, and the, 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 the kinds of works that the artists of that ambitious generation are now beginning to make in the 1890s, producing these works of tremendous um, uh, patriotic importance, of, of tremendous uh, importance to the future shape of American cities. They are deeply engaged now in public art in two directions, not only in decorating the great public buildings that are taking shape in the nation's capital, but also in producing the works that will fill our nation's first public museums. Uh, many of these artists, the first works acquired by the new newly founded museums were by artists from this founding generation of American art. And uh, we find here Frederick McMoney's statue of Shakespeare in the Library of Congress. Daniel Chester French from the Jacobson Collection, the Concord Minute Man, classic American theme. Uh, Daniel Chester French, of course, would go on to carve the Abraham Lincoln statue from the Lincoln Memorial. And we can see here this fascinating tension between uh, small-scale works produced for private consumption or for museums, and the monumental works that shape our very public consciousness of the aesthetic character of America. When we think of what America looks like, we probably all have in our minds a classic-looking library or post office or courthouse, the capital of Washington, a state capital. Uh, this architecture is taking shape at this moment in time, under the influence, the aesthetic imagination of this generation of tremendously ambitious artists. Mary Cassatt is another artist who turned her hand to mural production. She painted the, the fabulous uh, mural for the Women's Pavilion at the Columbian Exhibition in 1893. Unfortunately, the original is lost. We only have reproductions and preparatory studies, but Look at this. This is one of the most spectacular little studies I've ever seen. I love this work. Sarah Paxton Ball Dodson, another of those artists who studied in Paris with uh, the Blashfields, uh, uh, likewise turned her hand to mural painting, her work from the uh, World's Columbian Exhibition. And 
John Singer Sargent, likewise, the nation's most famous portrait painter. He spent much of his late career passionately devoted to painting uh, murals in public buildings, including the Boston Public Library murals, which are perhaps his most famous uh, uh, public art murals. Robert Reed, a veteran of the Sherwood Studios and a friend and associate of Edwin Blashfield, beautiful impressionist painter who then turns his hand to monumental mural painting in the 1890s. Here is his justice from the New York Appellate Courts building in 1899. His paintings for the Library of Congress in 1895. Wisdom, one of the, the subjects from that, uh, a detail from that image we just saw. James Carroll Beckwith, the, the, the social dean of the Sherwood Studios, uh, likewise from the intimate and private scale of his portrait of Bertha to his uh, studies for the unfortunately lost uh, pendentives from the Dome of Manufactures and Liberal Arts building at the Columbian Exhibition in Chicago in 1893. Willard Leroy Metcalf, another Sherwood Studios uh, uh, artist. Here, his, uh, his addition to the New York Appellate Courts building in 1899. And even Evangeline got her own monument. She died, unfortunately, young in the, uh, uh, the pandemic of 1919 and the Spanish influenza. And uh, if you go to Manhattan underneath the Queensboro Bridge on the edge of the city, there is a little monument which was designed uh, by her husband, Edwin, after her death, and was installed by the Municipal Art Society, the group that she had founded in 1893, a fountain to water the horses of the, uh, the colliers and the uh, green grocers who trucked across the Queensborough Bridge every day from Queens uh, to bring their, their goods to the bridge market here. Uh, and uh, in this age before the vehicle, the automobile, the horses needed water and Evangeline's idea had been for a fountain. We can see that the mosaic designed by Edwin recalls the red haired beauty from 30 years before. Uh, very clearly a reference back to a moment of idealism and optimism and expectation in his own career, in his own life and marriage that though it came to this sad end, had nonetheless seen through 35 years of marriage, uh, an extraordinary transformation of American art, and not just of the way Americans make art, but the way that Americans live with art and the way that they think about art's importance as a private, as a public good, as a democratic value. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been my pleasure to talk about the Jacobson collection. There's so many other stories we could tell. Uh, each of the paintings in the collection is itself an entry point to another story about American art and through the story of American art about our own country and civilization. I encourage you all to go down and, and take a close look at the collection and to think about the stories that it tells. And if you've already been, go back and have another look. Thank you so much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Scott. Does anyone have questions this evening? So the, the question I see in our chat, why is the painting covered with a green cloth? There I you think go. you're talking about the very first painting I showed uh, of the, uh, the Dutch uh, uh, genre picture. So in the, uh, the pre-modern period, uh, people actually covered their nice paintings with uh, curtains because before in the era before electricity, people lit their homes with very smoky fires and, and lamps and, and all sorts of other things, open flames. And uh, in fact, that was a way of protecting the painting from harm so that it didn't get smoky. And uh, uh, But it's also in that picture, it's a way of drawing our attention to the painting uh, that is, the maid is peeking behind the curtain, which allows us to peek behind the curtain and to see that the little glimpse of the stormy sea is uh, revealed to us almost like uh, the moral of a story, <laughs> almost like the, uh, the, the moral of one of Aesop's fables, something that tells us about 
the, the meaning of the picture. Uh, in fact, the red-haired beauty has sort of the same effect. Her drapery acts as a kind of veil that partly covers the Parthenon sculpture so that the sculpture isn't just staring us in the face. We have to hunt for it just a little bit to peer past her skirts to see that it's there. It's a way, it's what we call in art subordination, the artist disguising something important just slightly in the background so that we don't see it immediately. Um, is it true that Evangeline secretly painted some of Edwin's credited work? Uh, and if so, which works might they possibly be? No, so Evangeline, I know of only one work of art that Evangeline made. I have no doubt that she was a, a, a sort of amateur artist. Edwin did sling a fine brush, but she was the brains of the operation. <laughs> they published a lot. In fact, she was one of America's first art historians. And they wrote and published uh, in many places in American uh, 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 popular literature uh, at a time before there were any art historians in colleges anywhere. Uh, and so in their early publications, he gets credited for writing them uh, where I think he didn't write them. In fact, I think she wrote them. He provided the illustrations. <laughs> But in that age, um, she had no education. She hadn't gone to college. Uh, she had uh, a grade school education. But she was, of course, the daughter of one of the most educated men in, in, in America, the Victor Hugo's translator and the leading Egyptologist. And she grew up surrounded by intellectuals and, and scholars. And so it came very naturally to her. But I don't, I don't think she painted any of his works. I do think that he's gotten a lot of credit for her writing. And uh, I think it's time in art history to go back and reassess. Uh, I've been doing some of that work, uh, her contributions to the way that the artists of Edwin's generation really thought about what they were doing. Because the from John Singer Sargent to James Carroll Beckwith to Robert Reed to Edwin Blashfield to many of the other artists we've talked about here, her ideas about the role of art in society is what's really driving uh, their production of monumental and public art and, and art for, uh, for public consumption. Oh, other works that are wow moments for me. Thank you, Holly, that's a good question. So a lot, <laughs> uh, there are a lot of works. Um, I will say it's hard not to be bowled over by the Hudson Valley School paintings. We just talked about one today, uh, which is a small one by Jasper Cropsey. Uh, but, oh, wow. When you go down and you look at some of the just truly exceptional paintings from the 1840s, 50s, 60s, Kensett and Cole and, and uh, uh, some of these other uh, just spectacular works, Hazeltine, there are uh, such beautiful images of nature and of uh, uh, landscape in the collection. And then, uh, likewise, I'll say the, uh, the modernist works are just breathtaking, just spectacular. Um, and, you know, one of my favorites is actually a, a little known artist, and this is what I love as an art historian, is when you can bring somebody back who has been forgotten in some ways. That, that was the story for me with Edwin and Evangeline to a certain extent. But Elizabeth Mattern is another artist in the, in the exhibition who was in the, eight, in the 1940s at the moment when Jackson Pollock was hitting and it was abstract expressionism. She's an abstract artist of the first caliber who ha, uh, has been forgotten to a large extent. And I think that's one of the great uh, uh, values of uh, for instance, Diane's collection, is that it isn't just great works by top flight artists. It's great works by top flight artists who have also been forgotten or have been overlooked for one reason or another. We see that especially among women artists in the collection. And uh, uh, the great uh, uh, um, Linda Seidel, scholar in art history, who asked the question, why are there no great women artists? Uh, and, and it's not that there are no great women artists. That was the, the, her, the point of her question. It's that 
we have not given the space in our museum collections, in our art histories to women artists. And I think uh, that's one of the, uh, the real treasures of the collection is the, the diversity and variety that Diane has built up around artists, uh, uh, women artists and artists of color. Uh, it is, um, it's, a, it's a wonderfully broad, well, it's a comprehensive collection of American art and a very, very thoughtful one. The jugs and the urns in this piece, are they decorative? Or are they telling us something? I've asked myself that question a number of times. And uh, they are, I think, decorative, uh, yes. And, but I do wonder, uh, this one, this very funny looking round one with the narrow neck, it's what's known as a bombolus. And it's in particular associated with uh, graves and burials like the Tanagra figurines. And I've wondered if there's not some reference here to the idea of the past, our burial of the past, the excavation of the past, how we take lessons from a, a vanished past, a dead past, and revive those lessons for the modern age. So Evangeline and Edwin, they're not trying to make Tanagra figurines. They're trying to reinvent an ideal that comes out of those Tanagra figurines. So in some sense, they are... They're looking into the tombs of the past for inspiration for the future. Uh, what separates a painting that is considered great and art that is a nice painting but is not great? Well, uh, that, there are many good ways to potentially answer that question. And I'll tell you, I may not be the right person to, uh, to answer that question because I am not a critic, <laughs> but an art historian. Uh, which means that what makes a painting great for me is when I find that it is a work which tells an important story of almost any kind about the artist, about the moment in art history at which the work is made. I see works of art as deposits of moments in time where each intentional act by the artist to bring something into being is itself a way of recording processes of thought, of thinking, of feeling, uh, uh, of cultural relationships to art that are then fixed in place in the work. And I'm always interested in what those, those marks mean to us about the history of art. So I look for works of art that tell a great story. And perhaps that's one way of thinking about a great work of art. Of course, there are other ways, and Diane is uh, a, a, an excellent expert on this at this point in her career. And I, uh, I will redirect you to her, and she, she will, I'm sure, be able to talk about this in some of her upcoming lectures at the at the Cumber. But that is a central question for a collector: is what are the works that should be put in conversation with each other? And I would say that as a collection grows, uh, one of the answers, again, that we might make to that question is that a great work is a work that adds something to the conversation. It's not just a quality of the work in itself. It's the work in its context for us. That's one of the reasons why collections, whether Diane's or the Cummers or any other uh, collection, it's the, one of the reasons why collections are important is there are ways for us of curating memory and of telling stories that we need to preserve for our future. Well, thank you so much for your questions and thank you so much for attending our talk. Uh, it was my pleasure to be here with you and uh, I'll see you all at the museum. Thank you, Scott. What a fantastic evening. Uh, we look forward to seeing you all at the museum very soon. We'll send a follow-up email with some important dates, also a link to a survey. Uh, we do have a lecture with Dr. Jacobson coming up next Tuesday, so um, do look out for that on our website, and we hope to see you at the museum very soon. Let us know when you're stopping by. We'd love to walk the museum and the collection with you. Safe travels to Italy, Scott. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Everyone take care. Have a great night.